Hello, everybody. I am extremely excited today for two different reasons, actually three different reasons. You know, today we're going to talk about game changers for your new tap room, which is a topic I am very passionate and love having conversations about. And we're joined by six industry experts for this conversation. But we have the most people I've ever had in CPP on one of these panels. So you get seven beautiful faces on your screen today who are going to impart their wisdom to you. But secondly, I am very excited for today's conversation because it launches a series a partnership with startabrewery.com. And I'm very excited for that. Today, we're joined by Laura Lodge of startabrewery.com. Laura, can you tell us a little about you know, what you do and how this came to be? Laura, can you hear me okay? Yes, I have this horrible echo. It's looping three of you. So I'm not sure what's happening. Um, my phone is off, so I'm not sure what that's about. It's me. Hold on. How do I turn that off? Do you perhaps uh, have it open in two browser windows? I have two browser windows open. Okay, hold on. We're going to dive into the fun taproom related topic shortly, but startabrewery.com is a great resource for not only breweries and planning, but also, you know, anyone looking to grow. And there's a plethora of different topics you can find content on by a ton of industry veterans who write blogs, share content, join for monthly you know, Zoom sessions where they'll share their expertise. It's a great resource no matter where you are in your planning cycle of your brewery. But Laura's one of the founders of startabrewery.com, and we're excited for this partnership. Are we better? We can hear you. Okay. I can hear twice. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give a little backstory on how this came to be. So Laura and I, I have a lot of conversations about how the little things in a tap room can make a big difference, you know, whether it's just encouraging beer to go, introducing yourself. And Laura and I were having a conversation at some point over the past two and a half years where I was talking about one of my first brewery experiences in a while, you know, it's been a weird few years of pandemic for a lot of people. And for a lot of the pandemic, many breweries, you know, they served beer, they served it in plastic, which is, you know, a different kind of experience. So I think we all got a little accustomed to having beer out of those disposable glasses. And I remember the first time that I had went back to a brewery and we're going to add Laura back in for this one. Yes or no, Laura, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you only hear one of me? I can hear one of you. Okay, good. Tell me what you said last. Well, I, I was <laughs> talking about how you and I were chatting mid-pandemic at some point about I had got used to having beer in plastic glasses. Then finally, I went to a brewery and they served me beer in an actual glass. And it was the weirdest, most, most refreshing experience because just having that glass in my hand again out in public it was so refreshing. It was so nice. And it just blew my mind that something as simple as having a glass in your hand can make a really big difference to an experience. And I think that's what we're going to be diving into a lot further today with all the experts we have, just talking about how each unique aspect can contribute to the larger picture. But Laura, I will let you give that proper intro for startabrewery.com as well. Okay. Sounds good. Um, sorry about all the confusion there. Um, Start a Brewery was was founded. My friend Candace and I um, came up with this idea after a random email of, hey, would you like this, this URL? And um, really, the, the first goal was to provide a free resource for startups so that we can educate the startups um, and, and then have a better like launching place as, as consultants, as mentors, um, and really be able to raise the bar for startups and just, just be better by knowing more. And that's also morphed into and, and become a great way to lower the barrier to entry for a lot of people who don't have those, those mentors, don't have access, don't have um, really a knowledge of where to begin. So I think that um, Starter Brewery is serving two purposes here, both uh, raising the level of education by offering free um, information and by lowering the barrier by offering resources and a direction. And our contributors are fantastic. You can meet a lot of them here today. Um, I think ultimately we probably have up to 200 people at this point. We just have to wrangle them all and um, 
we're working on building a great library. So keep keep watching. We have a lot of things coming up that are going to be super great and super fun. Awesome. Well, Laura, I'm very, very excited for this partnership. We're going to do it quarterly, right? We're going to do it. Well, we're going to do the webinars quarterly. Um, looks like we have a podcast coming online, too. So we'll have lots of things going on. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really think that your your story about getting your beer in a real glass speaks exactly to what we're talking about today. The little things that make you comfortable, the little things that are a surprise, the little things that people didn't understand were so important. Um, and I think Dustin has seen some really neat ha things happen in his uh, tenure as far as building tap rooms. Um, Ren can certainly speak to some of the unexpected and, and welcoming things um, that we see. Nancy's helping to, to really make some of the touchless and uh, extra special things happen. Ben and Misty are working on, you know, making that tap room be branded and be part of who you are. And I know, Andrew, you and I have talked um, a lot about service and what makes service special. So I think this is going to be a lot about what your tap room could be if you did all the things. Yeah. And everyone listening today, I hope they have that one little takeaway they feel they can apply in their tap room, something they can apply to see greater success. And Laura, Sorry. you gave brief intros, everyone, but let's do a quick round robin and Ren, because you are at the top square. You get to tell everybody a little bit about yourself first. I feel like Hollywood squares. I'm like the I top know, square. right? Uh, I'm Ren Navarro. I run Beer Diversity, which I've been running since 2018. Uh, I think I just celebrated, celebrated my 10th year in beer. And I talk about and consult on diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, sometimes injustice. Uh, and, and really I am kind of a, a Jane of all trades and wander around trying to help people to, to get past, you know, diversity as a dirty word and just have really open and honest conversations about things. Cause if we don't have conversations like these, we don't make changes. And then we all sit in our corner saying, why won't things change? Uh, cause we didn't talk about it. So, uh, yeah. And I reside in Canada land. So I am the, uh, the Canadian troublemaker. I'm also here to tell you that Canadians aren't as friendly as you think. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here. Well, always great to see you, Ren. Nancy, you're up. Oh, Nancy, don't make yeah. me say it. You're on mute. Sorry, my dogs are barking, so I had to turn fair it enough, off. Fair enough. Sorry about that. What kind um, of dogs do you have, Nancy? I've got two big mutts. Two giant, <laughs> noisy, lovely mutts. Um. I am uh, Nancy Trigg. I'm the Chief People Officer and Head of Partnerships for Arrived Point of Sale. Um, I've been in the industry for, gosh, about seven years now. Um, my focus in every role, because I've had a lot of roles, had arrived over the years. Um, my focus has always been the human relationships, both inside and outside of our organization. Um, it's my passion. Um, I love people. I love humans. So um, and my information, the knowledge I have that I'm here to share is really not mine. Um, I work with hundreds of, of taproom managers, GMs, um, and I learn a lot from them and try and share the knowledge of what works with others that are trying to make their businesses go. That's one reason I love you so much, Nancy. That's such a great attitude. <laughs> Thank you. Ben? Hey, uh, Ben Weston with Hoptown Handles and Seathirst Creative. Um, Hoptown Handles is my first company, and we are an American manufacturer of custom tap handles. Uh, and then we also have a uh, uh, merchant apparel line to provide breweries with, uh, just as it sounds, merchant apparel that they can uh, sell to get their brand out into the world. And uh, Seafarers Creative was started uh, during the pandemic, and we do uh, creative branding and uh, merchant apparel design for, uh, for craft breweries. Well, great to see you, Ben. And Dustin, you know, I feel like it's been forever since we first met where I saw Laura for the first time in Richmond, Virginia, you know, for that brewery accelerator almost three years ago now. Things have changed a little bit, right? Yeah, a little bit. Things are, uh, you know, we're still doing uh, breweries and tap rooms um, and expansions and renovations of existing facilities. Um, but things are a little bit different, a little bit different considerations post-COVID and getting through that. Um but uh, yeah, we've been um, designing breweries for a little over 10 years now. Um, everything from the front of the house, how the tap room functions, whether it's a remote one or one that's on the brewery premises uh, to the back of house uh, production facility and, and how to make that flow as efficient, make the best use of that square footage as possible. I'm excited to have your insight today. And Misty, last but not least. Glad to be here. 
Hi, uh, my name is Misty Gordon. I am a multimedia graphic artist. Um, let's see, I started uh, my own business in 2010 after 10 years in the advertising world. I pretty much focus on craft beer branding, although um, I am building the Starter Brewery website and I met Laura a bazillion years ago by doing big beers. So lots of festival stuff as well. But um, right now, it seems like just the last couple of years, probably because of the pandemic, uh, branding has become bigger and more important than ever. And I just thought this was a, a fun, interesting topic. Always good to know where you are when you walk into a place. <laughs> Absolutely. No, Laura, you put together a great group of people today. I'm, I'm going to let you take over from here. Excellent. Um, let's start with the beginning. I mean, at the very beginning of your dream, there's a there's a vision of, of what your place looks like. And I think it's really important to um, think all the way through what your place looks like and how it works. And so I'm going to leave it to Ren and Dustin here to talk about um, how that vision translates into working for both uh, you and your staff in terms of efficiency and operation, and then who is your customer and, and how can we be super friendly and accessible to our customer? So Dustin, you want to talk off with some, start off with some building? Sure. I mean, one of the first things we start looking at is, is understanding you know, why are your customers coming to your space for a beer? Granted, it should be obviously your product, but what's bringing them there versus go getting your product at, at a pub somewhere nearby or anything like that. So they're there because it's the brewery, it's where it's made. So, you know, we really try to stress um, expressing that, making sure you have a good view of the brewery or, or a way to know that you are at where it's made. Um, for your for your tap room, and and then think about how your customers structuring your tap room. So how your customers enter and move about the space. How do they queue up at the bar? Sometimes that line can get really long. Where does that line go? How can that be? How can that move efficiently? Um, and is there a way to potentially expand your POS stations when you need to? If you need to bring in another person, then you can divide that line three ways to get it get that line move through faster. Um, and, and from the customer's perspective, what do they see when they walk into your space? Um, how do they how do they get to the bar? What do they see when they're when they're lined up at the bar? Um, you have to have some of the functionality behind the bar. You need your three compartment sink to wash glassware, your uh, glass washer to wash glasses quickly. But when that breaks, you're going to need that three compartment sink. You need a hand sink. You have a lot of like tools and supplies and things that you just need, but you don't necessarily want that all in the view of the customer. So how do you orient those things and arrange them so that their view and their experience, it, it's all about the customer's experience and how are they, you know, how are they able to order beer quickly? What are they seeing? How can you, you know, push your merchandise, any to go stuff? Maybe you have a, uh, a reach in door on your coal box so that you can display and grab and go stuff really quickly for a customer for their to go. Um, and then thinking about the, the experience within the tap room itself, can you break that out into private event space, maybe movable partitions for different sizes of things? What kind of furniture are you using for that space? Maybe it's on wheels or it's, it's easily movable, it's stackable, uh, can be combined. And instead of doing a, an eight seat table, do you do two, four, so you can break that out and combine it when necessary for different groups. So you're very adaptable to, to different things things and changing time. That's one thing we've certainly learned that we know for sure is going to happen. Trends will change and you need to be able to adapt and, and, and move with it. And um, <clears throat> thinking how your tap room, how, how it's lit, how it reinforces your brand. Um, you really kind of express what your mission is within that space. So you, they, they get a real sense of place with your, with your tap room. Um, other things we look at when we look at, uh, you know, something as simple as your bathrooms, you know, where, where are they? Are they easily very visible? Are they, do they have good clear access for, for your ADA requirements? Um, and are they, do they have enough capacity? Can you go to a, a unisex model where they're all accessible to all sexes to everybody so that you can kind of break up the line of the men's and women's line sort of thing. And, you know, maybe you can um, reduce the square footage by consolidating the, the sink areas into one shared sink area with separate restroom facilities, different things you can do to, to maybe increase your capacity, but not um, take more square footage to do that. Um, 
And then um, think about other efficiencies on the back of house side. How do you make it um, functional for your employees and operations? Um, do you have um, storage for extra tables and chairs, the ones that break? Um, and then you're trying to get, still get fixed. I go into a lot of places and I see in the corner, there's a stack of the chairs that the leg broke off of and they haven't fixed yet. And they're just kind of laying in the back of the brewery somewhere, like a place where you can, you know, maybe work on a few things and put things together. Where do you put those Christmas decorations or Halloween decorations all, when it's not that time of year? Where do you put all that stuff? You don't want to stack it on the same pallet rack as your, as your grain storage. You want to, you know, keep it for that, for the tap room, um, um, staff to, to easily access and store and where the overflow merchandise is. So when that, that, you know, that triple extra large shirt that, that, that I asked for uh, <laughs> isn't there and, and then you can, somebody can run back and get it easily or restock whatever um, has been uh, depleted. Um, and think about the, your, your, your employees and having maybe a, a, a small area for them as a break room where they can kind of get away take a breather. They're not taking a breather in the tap room. They work there. That's not necessarily where they want to be taking their break. Um, that they maybe they have their own restroom space, certainly give them some lockers, maybe in like a small kitchenette space where they can do their lunch breaks and things and kind of get away and kind of take it, take a real break. Um, and then we look at the, uh, the, the, the coal box I mentioned, uh, reach in for to go access, um, and a door that's easy for the employees to get in and change kegs when they need to. Um, and then it would be separate from the, from the brewery access. It's going to be probably a sliding door that allows a larger access for pallets. Um, note that a coal box that's over a thousand square feet has to have two exits anyways. Um, so it's, you know, the one thing to think about when you're on the tap room side of it, um, you're typically not stacking kegs over too high just because of the weight and the access to them. And so you don't need a coal box that's 12, felt 12 feet tall if it's only serving the tap room. Typically, a coal box that's only eight feet tall has room for, for um, two kegs that are stacked uh, too high and then some additional shelving above. Three kegs stacked high is still under eight feet. Um, so you don't need these massive coal boxes for, for the tap room unless potentially it's shared with the, the production side of it. So these are just a lot of different things that we kind of look at when we think about, you know, how your customers get into the space, how they move around, what is their experience, why are they there instead of at a pub someplace else, um, and then how you can make that space adaptable as possible. And not thinking only of the your customers, but also your employees. How do you make it as functional for them and comfortable for them so you can have that good retention for those good employees? Um, and so these are just kind of some of the things that we consider in every kind of layout that we do for, for breweries. And it's important to think that and understand that you know, we all know that things are going to change. So being as adaptable as possible for your space. Ren, what do you think, on? <clears throat> Ren, um, what can you bring? <laughs> so I'm outside of the building. Uh, so can I get in the building? Is it accessible? Is yes. it, you know, three steps to get in? There's a lot of breweries I talk to who say like, we don't have people who use wheelchairs or mobility devices. Of course you don't. There's four steps they can't get in. Uh, so <laughs> can I get in the building? Can I open the door? If I can't open the door, can someone open the door for me? Uh, once I'm in what's, you know, like Dustin was talking about, what's the navigation of getting through the space? Can tables be moved? If Again, if I'm using a mobility device or if I have a stroller, I know we all argue about kids in tap rooms, but it happens. Um, how do they get in? How do they move around in the space? You know, it's it's these things that we just we're not thinking about, which means that people can't inhabit the space. And if they can't inhabit the space in the community that you're now in, like you're not interacting with your community. So, you know, what's your lighting like? What's the sound like if I have hearing loss or any hearing difficulty? Am I able to even place an order or am I just kind of hoping for the best and pointing at things, um, you know, for staff? Also, what's what's the space again, like that they can navigate? Um, you know, I think that, that part of the big piece is navigation and, and how we use it and what the accessibility is within the spaces. Um, if you are doing whatever washer model that Dustin gave us, which, you know, of, obviously there are several options. Are there change tables? And when we talk about change tables, we're not talking for kids. Can it hold an adult? Um, because here, that's a big thing. Canada, we talk about this, right? So if, if, you know, if I have an adult with me who needs to be changed, can I use those change tables? The answer normally is no because we don't look at it that way. We're not thinking about that. Um, is the space, you know, is, is the, oh, an accessible washroom truly accessible? Um, a good friend of mine out here, Julie Sawchuk, who is an accessibility expert, uses a wheelchair 
and the amount of places that she calls out for not being accessible, even though they say they are, is astounding. So if you are building a tap room, talk to someone who actually will use the space or is an expert on that kind of stuff. Um, for most of us who do not really need an accessible washroom, we get it wrong. Um, handles, you know, the, the grab bars are never strong enough or they're at the wrong angles or, or, or. So how are we getting people in? How are we keeping them? Um, you know, when we talk about lighting, and I, and I know, Laura, you and I always talk about this, but like neurodivergence, if the place is too bright or it's too dark, it may affect someone. If it's too noisy, you know, the sound, um, I am absolutely affected by too bright light and anything that's too noisy, I peace out immediately. So is there a quiet time that you can have during the day? Probably because you're quiet, right? Like the tap room isn't bustling at two in the afternoon. So you know, maybe it's that we turn the lights down a little bit and we aren't playing, you know, death metal all day long at like ear splitting volumes. I mean, hey, you can play death metal, just turn it down a bit. So <laughs> it's just these, these notions of these things. Um, and then just talking to the community that you inhabit. Tap rooms are not building the community, they are entering into a community. Remember that, this is not your space. You are entering someone else's, which means that to have a really successful tap room, you need to understand who's around you. They don't have to understand you, it's the other way around. So go and talk to people, make sure that you talk to community leaders, talk to, to folks, explain what you are about. Don't just say we're a brewery. Um, I know that Dustin said that the beer is important. For me, it should be the last thing. If you have a tap room, I want to understand that I can feel that there is some attempt to make me feel safe, that there is accessibility. This is a space that I can inhabit with groups of my friends. And then, hey, the beer is really great. I think the, the beer is, is now a, a given. It needs to be super high quality and is not really, it's, it's almost a non-factor because it has to be amazing, but you have to get it there. Absolutely. Or you won't, you know, why come? Although... I should take that back. There are some community gathering spaces that maybe don't have as amazing beer, but they're also some gathering spaces. So thinking through and getting there. Um, awesome. So um, Dustin, have you seen some, some soundproofing or some different uh, ways to control? Do people do dimmer switches and things? Yeah, we typically do uh, dimmer switches for all of the um, customer areas. Um, the building codes require some, some sort of, um, uh, motion sense access for for restrooms and some back of house warehouse areas but on the customer side we try to do that as is controllable as possible sometimes they're color changing sometimes they're they're dimming we can set up mood scenarios of where you can kind of hit a switch and it'll turn everything a certain way um and then for for acoustics really kind of looking at what the finishes are and what the textures are we you know a lot of breweries are done in kind of warehouse type spaces where we have concrete floors metal or masonry walls and, and metal ceilings so we can do different things um sometimes it can be just the the artwork and the, and the uh, tapestries or fabrics that can be applied um you know one simple fix that does amazing well is carpet remnants um, attached to the bottom of tables and chairs. Um, it's amazing how well that captures the reverb coming off the floor up into the bottom of a hard-sided table. Um, and then there are some um, di couple different products out there for acoustic panels. It can be uh, layered across the ceiling in different patterns, whether they're hung vertical or, or horizontal as clouds. And a lot of different things um, that can be done. It's certainly some to consider. And typically, most tap rooms, we're not looking to try to make it a library sound. We're trying to just knock it down a little bit so that it still is a lively, but it's not painful. And you can still communicate when you're trying to order a beer or sitting there with friends, and it doesn't just turn into a, a real loud situation. Gotcha. Okay, well, you led right into talking about decor and, and hangings and, and things like that. Misty, um, let's talk about branding the space and making it um, really be who you are. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because people talk about branding and, and they think logo. <laughs> and yes, the logo, yeah, that is part of your brand. It, it's an absolutely necessary, it's a huge part of your brand, but it's not all. So when you start looking at like spaces, you want to consider your colors, the colors that you've chosen for your business. You want to consider typography. You want to consider what kind of signage you're putting up because, yeah, th there needs to be signage. People need to know where to go. They need to know where they're supposed to order. They need to know what they're ordering. Nothing is more frustrating than you go into a brewery and it's like, well, where is the beer list? And they don't have anything printed out and they've done a chalkboard, but you can't really tell. Is that like right now? Is that available? Um, 
or if you are two or three deep in a line and you look up there and you can't read it because they haven't picked a legible font, uh, things like that are really frustrating. And so I think that making sure that when somebody comes into the space, they know where they're supposed to enter, they know where they can exit, they know where the restrooms are, they know where the line starts and ends, they know where to go ordering pickups are, or if there's a line where that line goes, I agree with what Dustin was saying about where where's that line supposed to queue up. Um, they know where to find somebody, whether it's a, a bartender or a wait staff or somebody for food service, if they're supposed to order at a different stand or area for food, or if somebody's going to come to the table, is there table service? Um, all of those things. And I'm amazed at how many places don't consider their signage, which is a huge part of things. Um, then obviously I, I go to a lot of, you know, tap rooms because it's my thing. <laughs> and so uh, nothing's more frustrating than we go to two or three, just a you know, little tiny pub crawl. You don't remember where you were. You don't know where you are. And it's like, well, I don't know. What's the name of this? So obviously branding some of the things around you. Um, I've been to some that, that have done a good job of maybe even uh, branding the table with the woodcut or an actual brand. Uh, obviously glassware. Is your staff wearing things that let you know where you are? Um, is it on the menus? Is it on the signage that you're looking at? There's no reason that you can't have your logo on the restroom sign. You know, it might be overkill in some instances, but I, I'd rather see overkill than, than there being nothing. So um, to me, I'm, I'm constantly aware of how do you get to the spaces that you need to be, that signage. But then also, do you paint this, this wall, uh, I don't know, a Coca-Cola red because you really like that color, but then you kind of have to consider what what Ren was talking about and what Dustin was talking about. Can people handle a, a crazy bright red wall that runs the entire length of your brewery? It's awesome if that's one of your colors, but it's maybe not conducive to, hey, we're going to have a quiet hour <laughs> or we're going to have something else. So colors mean things. Um, they invoke different feelings. So if you want a corner that's like quiet and subdued and that people can go over there, maybe there's couches instead of the modular table setup that you need on the other side in order to accommodate larger groups and that kind of thing. So if you have kind of a warmer, softer space, you're gonna wanna pick a warm, soft color regardless of what your brewery colors are. So all of those considerations when you're starting out, when you're building that logo to begin with, and when you're trying to pick that typography and those colors, think about it from the ground up, that that logo, what you're choosing is going to become this whole big thing that needs to encompass space, needs to encompass glassware. I'm sure Ben's going to tell you about it, needs to uh, t-shirts and other wearables, other things, um, your menus, what your website looks like, what, how people can order. I'm sure Nancy will talk to that. Like how, how are you ordering and how are you then explaining where you are, who you are and how you're going to get that product and where you're supposed to go to do it. Awesome. Ben, you want to pick that up? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Missy touched on this, uh, but really that, that tap room is, it's an extension of your brand and that brand being essentially the, the, the look, the feel, the emotions that you're trying to evoke from your customer base when they, when they see your logo, when they enter your tap room, you're trying to evoke something in them and your tap room needs to, to kind of elicit those, those feelings, those emotions. So, you know, one thing that, that I get a lot, uh, that I see a lot of is, Oh, we want this, you know, we want this like rustic reclaimed wood uh, look in our tap room. But you have to think about does that connect with with what your core brand is, right? Does your core brand is your core brand supposed to evoke that, that rustic feeling or is your other brand are your other branding elements more modern, right? Maybe you should consider more of a modern look. But um, really, that's that's more of an aside. But but think about that brand when when it comes to spreading out across, you know, from 
your package goods, to your tap handles, to your, your distro signs, to your tap room, spreading it out across all those different areas. It should be this connected thread and, um, uh, you know, and include, include your merch in that. Um, you know, one, one thing that I get, um, that I get questions about is whether or not tap handles, you know, the tap handles in your tap room, whether those should be, you know, the same tap handles as are out in distribution, or you have a friend who's a woodworker and they make you these really neat uh, looking tap handles that you just want to display in your tap room. I am a proponent of, you know, connecting that thread. If you have custom tap handles that are out in distribution, you know, which a lot of new breweries might not be out in distro yet, but if you have a plan to be, you should set that expectation of what customers are going to be looking for when they're in other locations. Um, you know, are they, when they, when they enter your tap room, they should see something, the same thing that they're going to see when they go to uh, a bar three miles, 10 miles, 50 miles away. So they can immediately recognize, oh yeah, I saw that in the tap room uh, at this brewery I like, I'm going to get it here. So you want to make sure that those elements are connecting. Even if you're not selling to-go beer, right, in cans, um, you know, you should have cans available, even if it's just a display. Let's say you have cans available in the corner store down the street. You want to at least have some empty cans on the counter that show what your brand looks like when people get outside, outside of your tap room. So you want to have that um, that same connected branding. So hey, I'm in the tap room. I know what it looks like. I go somewhere else. I know what I'm looking for. Um, and then you know I also want to touch on merch in the tap room. You know a lot of new breweries. Um, you know, it's a thought of like, hey, I want to I want to be a, a you know, heavy tap room beer sale uh, model, right? Margins uh, for beer in the tap room are great. So you want to really push, you know, selling beer in your tap room. But while they're there, you should have other things for them to buy, whether it's food, whether it's, um, you know, merch, apparel, you want to have those things available. It's another source of revenue, but merch and apparel, especially, you know, everyone loves a good brewery hat. Everyone loves a good brewery shirt. You want to have those available because those are sources of advertisement. You know, you want things that a people are going to want to wear, right? So just a you know a cheapo junky shirt, it's you know it's fine. You might sell some of them, but are people going to actually wear them? Are they going to want to wear them out and about in their community? So you want to make sure that that they're they look good, and that they they feel good. They're quality. Um, you also want to uh, to price them appropriately so that you're going to get uh, people to actually buy them, right? If I if I walk into a, a brewery and I see a forty dollar uh, hat, eh, that's that's a little that's a little steep for me, right? It, you might it might be great margins for you, uh, you know. But if you sell five of them as opposed to thirty of them, you know, your margin your 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 individual margin is better. Uh, at 40, but if you're going to sell 30 at a lower price, you're going to make the same, if not more money. And you're going to have more people walking around wearing your hat, advertising your brewery and that, and those hats and shirts and other pieces should have the same look and feel that you're going for, for your brewery as a whole. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that, that connection. Yeah, excellent. Nancy, you want to pick up uh, how to, to purchase all these things and kind of some best practices and some maybe newer things coming along that, that can be super cool for your tap room and your customers? You bet. Um, and I, I want to start off by saying I don't typically focus on the order. I focus on the service experience. Um, I don't, I think sometimes if you focus too much on the order, service gets lost. Um, so I, I want to talk about that really. Um, little things, you know, Dustin mentioned that in the beginning, like when you're first building your tap room, you need to be thinking about where folks are going to order. Um, but that, those assumptions might change over time and you want to make sure that you don't 
sort of build yourself into a service model that no longer serves your guest up over time. So yes, yeah, starting with a counter service model might make sense, but maybe don't make the exit to the bar around the corner um, because you might decide you want your staff out and about getting out from behind the bar, walking around, engaging with guests, <clears throat> things like that. So you want to build that flexibility into your process from the very beginning. Um, thinking about if somebody, if we've got a, this beautiful outdoor patio, do I really want them to have to come inside to place an order? Do I want to consider floating service and maybe having somebody walk out to them with handheld devices? Um, or do I want to consider things like QR code ordering? Um, one thing to sort of give a nod back to some of the things Ren was talking about is I don't ever think anyone should do only QR code ordering and maybe that's just me, but um, that's limiting. There are going to be people who that is simply impossible for and very challenging for. So always have alternatives for your guests and make sure that you're building that into your experience as a whole because um, you don't want anyone to come in and simply not be able to order from you. That that's that's a miss, and it's you know it doesn't create a welcoming space either. So um, there's other things that you should be considering when it comes to um, designing the experience. So if merch is a big part of your business, maybe that merchandise needs to be better placed. Maybe it needs to be out front so people can see it. Maybe your staff needs to wear it. Right. Like, and part of the order is like, want one of these cool t-shirts like I'm wearing, um, just to ask them and keep that stuff moving. Um, it is. And I know Andrew, I'm probably stealing your thunder because you say this every time and so do I, but, um, gosh, asking people to buy stuff, you don't have to train your people to be hardcore salespeople, but to say, Hey, would you like another beer? Or, hey, would you like some to go beer with that? Um, there was, there's one of our customers. I love this. Um, not going to name any names, but they'll have their staff walk around. Um, and if they hear someone looking at the menu and saying, hey, have you tried these two IPAs? Which one's better? They'll just, without saying anything, run back to the bar, pour two tasters of the two IPAs and run back out and say, what do you think? Like try them both and talk to them about what's happening. Um, and there's so many things like that you can be doing to not just serve your guests, but delight them. And I think um, creating your space, creating your operational system, so your point of sale or your staff model, um, you need to be thinking about all the ways you can delight and not just assume that, again, everyone's going to want to get up, stand in line, um, order from a QR code. So be flexible, get to know your guests, understand what they need, and then switch your operating model up to support them. Don't make them adapt to you. Andrew? I don't think there's anything left to say, honestly. <laughs> you all have given so much great insight. And Laura, I think hope we hit your goals of touching on all the little things that make a big difference in a brewery. And one of the things Nancy mentioned, and I think Ben and Dustin and maybe Misty as well mentioned, and I think you might have mentioned it as well, it's about, you know, is your staff wearing your own shirt? And I, I think that's a really important thing that's often overlooked sometimes. Because if I go into Nancy's new brew pub and she's wearing a shirt for another brewery, I'm going to say, hey, Nancy, how is that brewery on your shirt? And you're going to tell me, well, it's amazing. That's why I'm wearing the shirt. And guess where I'm going to go have my next drink? I'm going to walk down the street and I might go there. So I think it's really important. I'm sure Ben can speak to it from the branding perspective of having your team wearing something that has your branding on it. So they keep seeing it over and over again. And there's that consistency that lines up. And one of the things I really like to speak to, and Ren, I know you did mention this. I think you said that beer might be your least favorite part of the taproom or brewery experience. Yes. And I like to look at the taproom experience like a Venn diagram you did in elementary school. You've got the beer at the top. You know, unless you're making great beer, you're not going to survive. You absolutely have to make great beer because that's the anchor of the experience. And most of you touched on the importance of having that memorable and accessible atmosphere. I think that's so important. You know, everything from the sound of the music to the temperature in there, how easy is it to get your way around? I mean, Dustin, you gave like a five minute masterclass on just the brewery design today, and that was amazing. So I think having that atmosphere is a really 
important part of it. It's just a huge anchor of the brewery experience. And also, in, it's all about relationships and connecting with guests. And that's where your staff comes in to have that engaging staff experience. And so you've got the quality of beer, you've got the engaging staff, and you've got that memorable atmosphere. And that really comes together to form what I like to refer to as that wow experience. When you're able to hit on all those boxes, you know, you're going to blow someone's mind and they're going to leave saying they're not going to say that beer was great. They're going to say, oh, my gosh, Misty was the best server I've ever had. And it's going to create that connection and make them want to come back. You know, and wearing my secret hopper hat, we did a study a while back at 6,000 plus brewery visits. We found that when someone visits a brewery for the first time, if they receive low engagement, they're, I think, 45 percent likely to you know, recommend return to that brewery. And low engagement is when you go and the staff goes through the motions, but you don't feel that connection. But when you go and Laura's giving you the best service in the world, she's bringing you those samples. She's you know, explaining the to-go options, walking you through the menu. When you feel that level of high engagement, the first time visitor is going to be 99 percent likely to return and recommend to that business. So I think, you know, it speaks to the importance of just building these relationships. And that's why we go to tap rooms to build relationships with our guests, with other customers, you know, even relationships between team members, because we all know that when staff work behind the bar and they don't like each other, it's going to be a really inefficient experience. But if Dustin and I are working together on a busy Saturday and the bar makes sense, we're going to be helping one each other out. It's going to allow us to engage with more guests when we can engage with more guests, we're going to see higher tabs because the guests are going to have the opportunity to feel that connection with us. So I think there's been so many great takeaways from today's conversation. And Nancy, what you mentioned about just asking questions, you know, can I get you anything else? Can I encourage beer to go? I think we take it, for example, for granted many times that someone going to a brewery knows that you offer beer to go. But, you know, as we seek to expand and make craft beer more accessible, you could have people come into your tap room who have never, ever visited a brewery in their entire life. And that blows all of our minds because we probably visited 10 breweries in the past week. But when you have someone come in, it's their first brewery experience. They might not know that those tanks behind them are serving the beer that they're drinking right now. So I think it's really important to provide that level of education. And it really begins when someone first walks in the tap room and that ordering experience that Dustin touched on to that final touch when you thank someone for visiting. There's so many little ways we could maximize someone's experience. Yeah, can I jump Absolutely. in real, real quick on, on a couple of those points? Um, sure. I think that, uh, you know, as a patron, I'm super impatient. So the quicker you can help someone, right, when they walk in the door or when they sit down, the quicker they can have service from someone, the better. Like, if, I, if someone doesn't help me relatively quick, I'm usually like, I, I'm just gonna go somewhere else. Um, maybe that's maybe that's just me, but you know, I think that that can be helpful. Getting people that service, making them feel welcome immediately is important. And then on the way out, I also don't like to, um, I don't wanna have to pay twice for things, right? If, I have, if I'm paying my bill at my table and then I see a, a shirt or a hat on the way out, do I want to have make another transaction? Probably not. Like if I can do both transactions at once, that's super helpful. So that was it. I agree. Yeah. I, you know, I would like, I like when they ask me if I would like another beer, if I want another beer, I don't want to have to ask for it. Like I'm, you know, at somebody else's kitchen or somebody else's dining room table. It's kind of like, I, you're going to sell it to me. So you come ask me if I would like another, I'm more than likely to say yes, <laughs> if you do. Um, but if I have to wait around or go seek out um, somebody to serve me, then, then maybe not, maybe I'm, nah, I'm done, you know, kind of thing. So. Yeah. And, and Ren, can you give us a couple pointers or maybe a, a starting place to help our staff be more familiar and more prepared and more educated about how to be welcoming and how yeah. to be accommodating? Don't be surprised when people of a certain age show up. Don't be surprised when a certain group of folks show up. Um, there's nothing worse. You know, my, my mom loves going to tap rooms. Like she's got a bunch close to her. She lives in a small town and they're just like, hey, what's up? You know, and it's, and she's, she's gone to places where they're like, how did you find us? Like, you know, so it's, it's this thing of, if you, if you talk about being welcoming to all, because a lot of people are putting that post, you know, at their, at their front doors, truly do it. And, and just use regular language. I mean, we're all beer nerds. We love using all the acronyms and all the like side hand things. Just talk about beer in a way that it's beer is beer. Um, ask people what they normally drink, 
right? If you haven't seen them before, don't make them feel like you shouldn't have found us and you suddenly have learned the secret handshake. Um, what do you normally drink? If they're drinking macro, then tell them what your brewery offers that is similar to it. Like this is all it is, right? Like don't judge them on the spot for drinking what they drink. Um, you know, and, and I mean, even the most diehard beer nerd has a favorite macro. So <laughs> it's the, you know, it's that initial piece that makes such a big difference. It, you know, like Ben was saying, if you walk in and you have to wait, guess what? You're not going to wait. You're going to turn around. You're going to leave. If you had a hard time getting in, if you couldn't sit, um, if the staff kind of glossed over you. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, what do you want to do? You want to sell your product. You want people to talk about your product. You want to keep the lights on and you want to pay your staff. If your staff is kiboshing your stuff from the get go, you're not going to make money. You're not going to keep the lights on. So it's just this, like, if you want to be welcoming, truly be welcoming. And, you know, it's, it's just this, this, thing that at first it might feel weird, but make it the spot that folks want to go to and continuously stay in. Because that's the piece, right? Your tap room should be a hub. And it shouldn't, you know, and I know that, that everyone said beer is really important. Yes, it's important, but it should not be the reason I stay. It's, it's the piece that like accents my staying. Um, you know, and I know that Nancy had started alluding to it, but this, you know, the notion of spaces, and, and I think I'm, just, I'm going to throw it to Nancy because I feel like she's got something about it. But I think that, yeah, turning it into a real hub is, is so important. Awesome. Yeah, I wanted to add um, the the concept of community spaces, right? We've, we've talked a lot about the tap room and its function itself, but every single community has needs for space. Like there's no community I know of that doesn't need space for something. Um, and so it's really important to get to know the needs of your community, right? So let's say you've got, you live in a town that has a lot of science research centers. Well, make it a space for science talks, right? They're constantly looking for places to go where they can share their knowledge with the com community, things like that. Um, if you're in an area with a lot of, you know, nearby a lot of schools, set up an after school grading hour with discounts for teachers, right? figure out what your community needs in terms of gathering spaces and offer that back to your community. Um, that's going to build loyalty. It's going to build return guests. And it's going to say to your community, I get you, right? I understand the needs of this area and I'm going to make sure I'm providing those on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that connection with your community and, and, and valuing where you are to Ren's point of you're moving into somebody else's space and to your point about appreciating the people that are around you and what you need. Um, there's a lot to be said for working with local nonprofits, the people that are right there in your area, um, getting to know your neighbors, all of them, um, supporting all of your like first responders and, and things like that. I think the more you can connect with the people in your local immediate neighborhood, the more you're you're growing and organically going to to be welcoming in the place where people hang out. Well, and I think that, you know, kind of jumping off of what Nancy was saying about the QR codes and stuff, like we have to talk about socioeconomic accessibility. And it's not, you know, I'm not asking people to give away beer for free, but like if you do a $5 pour on Mondays, like don't make it that it's debit card only or plastic only, um, allow people to use cash. Don't, don't say that it's only QR code. And, you know, to Misty's point, like, can I read the sign when I get in? Um, have a logger that's accessible in terms of price points and flavors, because those are the people in that community that you really want to show that this is a space that is for the community. And it's not just, you know, capitalism. It was capitalism all along. Like, <laughs> it's, you want it to be that, you know, that extra piece. So, yeah, if you're going to go with QR codes, make sure you have paper options. Make sure that you have visible signage that's, you know, over the bar that people can see. And I think that, like, those tiny little pieces make such a big impact on, on what you can do and the longevity of how you will continue to do it. And there's some little pieces, like at one of the restaurants I worked at, the, the host at the host stand always had some reading glasses. Um, you know, make sure your staff knows what kind of extra help they have and, and build some, some simple resources for those kinds of things. Um, I think that there's a lot of wow factor to be had from uh, simply knowing where to be able to have that QR code so that there's an app that can read the menu out loud to somebody or to have the printed version if somebody can't see, you know, back to back to being able to do everything different ways. Um, I think that's super important. I thought uh, anybody it was having... nice. Oh, sorry, that I, I did go into a place with my father not long ago, and he's, you know, mid-late 70s. 
and it was QR code. I had gone off to the restroom. By the time I came back, the, the waitress had actually taught him how to use his phone to, to open that up and stuff. And, and so I thought that was wonderful that if you're going to force a model, that at least they were willing to accommodate that, that he's like, I don't know. And so she helped him and he like knows how to do it now. So he picked up a skill as well as a beer. And so it worked out for him. Excellent. Anybody want to throw anything else out there? We're getting closer to that time. I don't know, Andrew, how much leeway we have. We can go as long as you like, Laura, but I'll draw attention to something in the comments right now. Someone said, you know, we mentioned teacher and first responders. What do you all think of a sensory evening for parents and autistic children? I have an employee who pitched the idea, but I've never seen it. And so first off, I love that idea. I think you should try every idea once, as long as it aligns, you know, with your vision and mission as a brand. And, you know, an event like that will probably give those parents an opportunity to go out when they may not have the chance. So I definitely think you should try it. But anyone else on the panel? I, have any thoughts on that? Like, um, I was Maybe like, yeah. Then? I know, I, I think it sounds great, but when you're doing it, make sure you do your homework first. Don't just be like, we're doing a night, it's gonna be great. Uh, make sure that you understand what some of the sensory things are. Uh, talk to the parents in your community, because they might be like, hey, do you know what? Actually, if it's too dark, that's you know that's the trigger for my, my child, these certain sounds, these certain noises. Is there a spot that if someone has a meltdown that they don't have to leave the building and they can just go sit in the corner? Like understand those things. And if you do not have a space that someone can kind of go and hang out in, like then talk to Dustin and understand the layout of, of what you've created. Because if you don't have kind of these emergency spaces, then you're having people in very open rooms and that might be triggers. So don't just do it, do some homework first. And from a, from a marketing perspective, you know, sometimes just posting on your Facebook page or Instagram or whatever that you're having a night might not be enough to actually get those people into your space. You might need to reach out, uh, as Ren was saying, reach out to those communities and make sure they're aware that you're having this type of night. Find out what, you know, are there certain groups that you can communicate with that will be able to communicate that message in a better way than just a, a post. Mm -hmm. And on an ongoing basis, I think your staff needs to know, we have accommodation for this, or we have some tools for that, or we have um, a kit or some special menu items, or um, we have those reading glasses, we have uh, wheelchairs, we have high chairs, we have um, you know, extra disability like support, you know, they need to know how to help it, just like you need to, to let your customer know um, what we can accommodate. And especially for regulars, make sure you're doing that to the nines, ask them what helps. Um, and Laura, we have one more comment in the, in the okay. comment section. Rich in New Orleans is opening a brew pub and there's, they're going to have a full kitchen. Any suggestions on the differences I should look out for from a typical brewery only tap room? Dustin, I bet you might have something to add on that one. <clears throat> um, yeah, so it really depends on kind of understand that your your kitchen is a different model from your tap room and it's a completely different business. But being you know on your side of it, on the on the operator side of it, for on the customer side of it, it needs to feel cohesive. Um, being able to have um, a tab, not having to have to have a separate tab for beer that you would for food. Uh, that's very cumbersome upon your guests. Um, making maybe making an easy way for them to order that you can order food separately from the beer so you're not waiting for somebody ordering one or the other to make a decision on all these samples they're trying when you just want to order a piece of pizza or whatever you know being able to split that up and you can break up the lines a lot of places will do a line for food and beer so you can order your food and your beer in one spot and then a separate line for beer only so that you can keep that beer line moving quickly um, really just kind of understanding what your clientele is um, keep your your food fairly simple, uh, make, making sure that hopefully it pairs well with your beers, maybe even um, offer recommendations for pairings of different food items with, with different beers so you can kind of expand that. Maybe they'll try a beer they wouldn't have had because you recommended that brown ale with their uh, poutine or something that they may not have thought of, and so they wouldn't have had that beer otherwise. So offering that pairing can kind of expand that 
that uh, exposure. Um, one thing to be aware of too, if you're going to have food is now you're in the world of modifiers, flexibilities, allergy management. Um, and so you're going to make, have to make sure that you have a system, um, not just a technical, your software system, but also your staffing system that creates the right kind of communication from front of house and back of house or from ordering to food production. Because if you make mistakes around allergens or people's food requirements, um, you can find yourself in a world of trouble. You don't have to navigate that quite as much with beer. So it's something you're really going to want to put a lot of thought into is how you make that uh, menu modifiable for everyone. Um, also, another thing that's going to be a big deal is how you manage order flow, because how you manage order flow impacts how that kitchen operates. Right. If you have, let's say you're doing table service and your servers are going to one or two tables and then going and putting in all those orders at once, you could be sending 20 food items in at one time, which can overwhelm your kitchen and make service really negative. So you're going to want to figure out things like, you know, can we use handhelds and orders straight from the table so that we're sending those kitchen orders through as they come in and helping manage the flow of food. Um, so there's a lot more that ha you really have to think about in terms of how you're going to operate and how you're going to accommodate um, once you add food. And I'll give a Nancy hopefully approved suggestion. If you offer food and someone orders just a beer, make sure you're encouraging food to go along with that and vice versa. If someone you know orders some food items, say, hey, you know this beer would pair really nicely. Just that little question asking them can put the idea in their head. And as Misty said earlier, you're more likely to say yes. The guest is at least. Any other questions there, Andrew? That's it, Laura. Excellent. Um, thank you all for being here. If anybody has anything they want to jump in on at the last second, this is the time to do it. Um, this is a great starting point for folks. As you learn things, share with people around you. Because I think that the more we're, we're able to share, the more that these things, you know, these questions will come up as much. Um, people can give tips and what worked and what did not work. Uh, you know, I think that, that, again, keeping this conversation going in a really simple way. Um, you know, if you're, if you're watching this or listening to this somewhere, like, you've got a bunch of us just, like, chomping to keep talking about it. So uh, definitely make sure that, that you, you do your homework and, and it'll, it'll come. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, where can people find this later? Well, anyone looking to watch this after the fact can go into YouTube and search Craft Beer Professionals. It'll be there. It'll also be on our Spotify channel. But Laura, I was going to throw a plug your way. If people are looking for more resources to grow their brewery or expand you know, what they currently have, where can they you know, find a resource that's extremely valuable? Sure. Startabrewery.com. Um, we have a big library that is is getting so big that Misty's probably going to have to like rework it. <laughs> um, so we're expanding with all sorts of of complimentary free uh, information that can help to to better your knowledge and and maybe your approaches and and offer more perspective on getting started and on some of the finer points of doing things. And in all of our sections, our plan, act, open, and grow sections. There's a task list that talks about things that you should be thinking about and working on throughout these processes. And I think that that's um, super valuable as well. You might not have thought about some of these things that you should be considering ahead of time. Um, so I think that there's there's plenty to do and it's all free. So take a look at startabury.com and hop over to our educational resources for some more places to learn as well. Awesome. Well, this has been a blast, Laura. Thank you for initiating this partnership. It's always great to learn from you and Ren, Nancy, Ben, Dustin, Misty, and Laura. That's a mouthful right there. Thank you all for joining <laughs> us today and everybody listening. There was so much insight they all shared today. So I feel even if you listen for only 60 seconds, you probably walked away with a drop of wisdom. So thank you all. And thank you, Laura, for putting this together. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Good to see everyone. Bye. Likewise. Bye.